Good morning, everyone, for those in the U.S., and good afternoon to everyone in the U.K. Welcome to this week's Heartbeat UK Technical Conference. Today, we will have one presentation, and we are scheduled to end at the latest at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. This presentation will be recorded and accessible online once we've processed it. If you have any questions during the presentations, uh, please type it into the message box provided in the application. Also, please make sure to mute your mic during the presentation to prevent any background noises. Today, is our son from the UCLA will be giving a presentation titled Test Guided Heterogeneous Information Network Embedding. Without further ado, allow me to introduce you as our son. Hi, so uh, thank you for the introduction and good morning and good afternoon. So today I'm going to present our recent progress on the heterogeneous information network embedding and uh, how, and uh, more importantly, how this embedding can be generated uh, via the guidance of different tasks. Okay, so information network actually can be used to represent a lot of um, different uh, systems, so I will give a bunch of examples later. But here I want to deliver a message that in order to mine those information networks, actually a uh, similarity metric between nodes becomes a very key uh, uh, functionality and once we know how we can evaluate the similarity between nodes then we can do a lot of things like clustering uh, which means find communities in information networks classification which means we can assign a label to each node and many other different tasks so how we can uh, compute the similarity between nodes by just uh, using link information? There are actually several uh, work, including our own work, PASI. Um, but unfortunately, if we look at these methodologies, they are mainly based on the uh, connectivity of the uh, links in, in this network. So uh, in order to obtain this pairwise similarity, we need to first store pairwise similarity. So if you are considering a network with like uh, millions of nodes, then you have to store uh, this million uh, times million this uh, space to use this space to, to store the similarity. So computational is very expensive. So is there any other method to solve this problem? So that's why recently uh, we are very excited about uh, try to represent each node by a feature vector. So once we have a nice feature vector for each node, then definitely we can use a lot of traditional mining methods to do clustering, classification, similar search recommendation. So here is a very simple example, which is a protein uh, interaction network. Each node here are protein, and uh, each link here are kind of interaction between them. So very naive solution that, how about let's just use this agency matrix where each row just denote uh, each Hi, I apologize. I apologize for interrupting. Um, we're just having a problem with the visual real quick, so I'm going to um, remake you presenter again and then basically just restart it real quick. I apologize, but we're not getting the visuals. Okay. So... From my side, what else I need to do? Uh, just give us one moment. Sure. So is everything okay now? Uh, it's it's currently still. Wait, hold on. Uh, the slides are. Mm. 
Uh, yeah, it looks like it's working. Could you could you go through the the slides again, or just uh, switch to the next one? So start from the very beginning. You mean? Um. So yeah, it looks like it shows. So what what happened? Because I didn't know like what it looks like in your end. This kind of blowed or something like that. When, when we originally connected, um, we were getting a good visual of the full slides. Um, mm -hmm. and right, whatever's happening right now is perfect. So we're getting the full slide. Yeah. So it looks. It we're looks good, good now. now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So should I start from the very beginning, or it's fun to continue? Um, I would I would start at the top again just because the slides weren't coordinated at the beginning. Okay, I see, I see. Then I will restart. Okay, so well, uh, again, today I'm going to introduce how we can do embedding uh, in heterogeneous information networks, and more importantly, how those embedding can be generated according to different tasks. So information networks has uh, like very wide applications, uh, including in. Uh, my uh, biomedical domain, which I will give a bunch of examples later. So here, my message is that once we model our data into information networks, actually a lot of like important money functions can be performed on such networks, like clustering, namely finding communities uh, in this network, classification, namely try to assign some important labels to each node and the similarity search, recommendation, link prediction, and so on. So in order to really uh, do this mining in information networks, actually a very key question that how we can find or define similarity metric between nodes. So uh, to address this issue, actually uh, we uh, a bunch of existing work, including our own uh, study, uh, try to use the link to define a, a similarity. Uh, between two nodes. So most likely it's based on like random work or other paths uh, that try to connect two nodes, then we can define the similarity. But uh, unfortunately there are kind of two uh, limitations of this type of work. The first limitation that we really need to use a very large space to store those similarity. Because once you propagate the similarity between two nodes, like every uh, two nodes will have some sort of numerical value indicating their similarity. So consider a big network, like one million nodes, then we have to use one million times one million, this gigantic matrix to store the similarity. And secondly, it's very computationally uh, expensive uh, because uh, we actually have to use like uh, costly matrix operation to compute those link-based similarity. So uh, recently there's a trend that instead of trying to directly compute a pairwise similarity score, uh, instead we wanted to kind of represent each node with some uh, feature vector. So if we look at the example below, it's a protein interaction network, so each node here is sort of protein and uh, each link here is the interaction between them. So naturally, we can represent this protein interaction network by the uh, agency matrix on the right hand side. And a very naive solution to represent each node is just to use the row vector, which just indicates its connection between the node uh, specifying that row to all the nodes uh, in the remaining of the network. But of course, it's also a uh, like very unwise uh, way to represent each node because, again, consider one million network. Okay, so this representation is going to be extremely high dimensional and uh, there, uh, there will be no global structure captured in this kind of representation. So suppose we can consider two nodes and they do not have immediate common neighbors, then if we compare their row vector, the similarity is also going to be zero. But it doesn't mean that if two nodes do not have direct neighbors, definitely have a similarity of zero, So, so which is uh, not reasonable. So more recently, people try to use a much lower dimensional feature vector to represent each node. Okay. So, um, 
basically now instead of considering like one million uh, dimension uh, feature vector for each node for those large scale networks, we we'll probably just use 100 or 200 or even 50, this kind of dimensionality. And this kind of uh, embedding of feature vector can capture the global uh, network information. Okay. But uh, unfortunately, in the uh, recent literature, people just uh, treat network as this homogeneous network. Actually, the protein interaction network is one example of a uh, homogeneous network, where only one type of nodes are there and one type of links are there. Uh, and also, another limitation that they, they just uh, try to provide embedding. So whatever task you ask me to do, I just give you the same copy of embedding which is also not that reasonable because essentially probably we need to use different embeddings for different tasks. So our work actually uh, tried to deal with uh, those uh, two limitations and uh, uh, we want to see, uh, we want to answer the question how we can do the embedding in a heterogeneous network. So here I give an example of what a uh, uh, heterogeneous network uh, look like when considering the uh, healthcare case. Okay, so basically we have each node. So here, this is a kind of schema of the uh, network that we could have. So here each node just represents a node type and each link here actually represents a link type. So for example, here we we'll probably have patient and uh, uh, they uh, have some uh, symptoms and they uh, have diseases and they are treated by drugs and drugs has side effects and drugs uh, contain like chemical compound and things like that. So we can see that actually we are living in a very complicated uh, world. Okay, we have so many different types of entities. They are interacting with each other with so many complicated relationships, right? So, uh, so basically th this kind of network is called heterogeneous networks by us. And we're trying to say that how we can use this very complicated and very rich uh, like link information to to uh, map each node here into low dimensional space that will kind of capture uh, this information in the heterogeneous network. And secondly, how the embedding can be guided by different tasks. So we don't have to have the same embedding for the same task because Sometimes probably you think for drug recommend, uh, recommendation, uh, then the embedding we want for the patient could be very different if you want to do uh, some sort of like disease diagnosis, diagnosis. So basically the embedding really depends on the task. So as I said, uh, we, we really want to address the two challenges here. Uh, so we want to represent node into a low dimensional feature vector. Uh, and uh, this low dimensional feature vector, which is called embedding, should be guided by a specific mining task. And the second, we really want to use uh, the different type information on the links. So they will contribute differently on different mining tasks. Although there are so many mining tasks, so in today's talk, I'm going to mention two. The first one is how we can do anomaly detection for uh, like. A heterogeneous categorical event which can be uh, like modeled as a heterogeneous network. And the second is um, actually for the second one I do not have like a um, very nice example in, in, in healthcare so uh, I just uh, tried to use a very um, simple task like how we can predict the authors for anonymized papers but more generally this problem is linked to a uh, link prediction problem and if we wanted to do like drug recommendation or disease diagnosis, this kind of technology should also help. So now let's first come to the anomaly detection uh, uh, task. So basically uh, for anomaly detection, um, I just gave you like 30 seconds uh, kind of tutorial. So basically if uh, a data point uh, can be represented by a k-dimensional um, feature vector, then we want to see whether there are some data points are really far away from kind of those dense area. Okay, so a very naive solution is that 
We first do class reading based on those k-dimensional features. It could be, uh, the, for example, the residence houses uh, in some area, right? So we have this dense area. Uh, we can do this by doing some clustering. And then we can compute the distance of some data points to uh, the dense area, for example, to the center of this dense area. And we can identify in this case that O1 and O2 actually are far away from all those dense areas. Then probably then we can define them as some sort of anomaly. Okay. So this is quite natural in uh, like traditional setting when the data is just represented by uh, like k-dimensional feature vector. But how about this time uh, we do not have those very nice numerical uh, k-dimensional features. Instead, we have these categorical features. Okay, so here I, I just uh, give you an example um, uh, of what is a categorical event in a healthcare setting. So suppose now we have the kind of healthcare record for patients. So for each patient or each admission of that patient actually can be considered as a categorical event. So for example, for, for a patient, we, we know uh, their gender, age group, uh, lab test result and symptoms, weight, blood sugar, and all things like that. Okay. So for, for many of those uh, features like symptoms, they're not as numerical values. For age group, of course, they can be considered as numerical values, but you can further group them, so they can also be discretized. And for gender, like female, male, they are not numerical values. So it has become very difficult if we wanted to compute like the distance between between two patients here, or uh, in other words, two categorical events here, because uh, how we can so like in, in the if all the features are numerical, then we can use maybe Euclidean distance or things like that. But now how we can define this distance between two symptoms, like a fever and a chest pain, right? So so in so we, actually we uh, be, because it's very difficult to do that. So we wanted to uh, try to propose a different approach to. Uh, uh, determine whether a uh, categorical event here probably you can consider uh, an admission of a patient, uh, whether they're anomaly or not. So um, instead of trying to compute the distance between two categorical events, we try to directly define the probability of the event. So how how uh, the like event, uh, how likely this event will appear? Okay, according to all our observations. So if we look at the previous example, so it can also, the anomaly like O1 and O2, they can also interpret it in this way. So it's like O1 and O2, actually they appear with a low probability compared to the points coming from those dense area. So similarly, if we can directly define the probability of each category event here, then probably we can just uh, uh, say that, okay, if this category event just appear with a low probability, then we are saying that, okay, uh, probably we need to take care of this uh, patient because he or she looks so unusual compared to other patients because the likelihood to have this kind of case is so low. All right. So um, how why this problem is linked to like network? So actually, for each category event we can consider it as a pseudo-node, okay? And a pseudo-node, of course, it's a, uh, always, we always have those new pseudo-nodes because we always have those new events. But if we look at the attributes, uh, those categorical attributes linked to those events, actually they are not uh, always new, okay? They're always something uh, that are existing. So in our case, for example, for each patient, uh, they link to uh, gender, female, uh, okay, so now we, we treat each attribute of value uh, as an entity. So those female, male, age group like 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and the symptoms, all the things actually kind of existing. Okay, so those values are existing values. So we just treat our new event, which just uh, updated so frequently, 
as a student node, they link to some uh, existing like attribute value based entities. Okay, so then we want to explore the so-called second order interaction to capture uh, the entity similarities. So here again, the entities are just the attribute values that are taken uh, in each uh, categorical uh, attribute. So in our case, female and male are entities, and uh, and the fever, uh, the symptom, and the chest pain, the symptom are also entities. So we just want to use this network to capture the uh, kind of similarity between entities. So more formally, each event now can just be represented by a tuple uh, with like m different entities. Okay, so m is depend on like how many uh, uh, Categorical attribute we are considering. Okay, so and for each type of uh, like attribute, right? So we can take a very concrete value. So it's like for example, for the gender type, we can either take a female or male in the age group value. We can either take like ten to twenty or twenty to thirty. So now we can represent each event. And since we're trying to uh, showing that actually. The invading based approach can be used to uh, solve this type of problem. So here we just say that for each like entity here, we just ask them to be associated with a feature vector, or in other words, an invading vector. In other words, female, this entity is going to be associated with an invading vector. Male is also going to be associated with a feature vector, and the, all the symptoms are also going to be associated with different. Uh, uh, invading vectors. So once we have this invading vector, uh, later we're going to show that how we can define a probability of this event. Again, the, this event is linked to like multiple entities which are, have been uh, observed previously. So what's the heuristic here? So there are like two heuristics. So the first heur heuristic that two entities are closer if they interact more frequently via the pseudo event, so in other words, if they co-appear in the pseudo uh, in the pseudo node or in the events quite often, then probably we say that okay, those two entities are, are close to each other. So uh, an example is that uh, the chest pain symptom probably is very likely to co-appear with the overweight, uh, which which we also treated as a kind of entity, right? So which just the data will tell us whether two entities are close to each other. And next here is taking that if we have observed event and if we consider the pairwise interaction of those entities and they, those entities are just very close to each other, then uh, with a very high probability this event will, will appear. Okay, because uh, for every uh, pair of those attribute uh, entities, they, they just are uh, uh, very close to each other. Okay, so with these two intuitions, then we can define uh, the probability of event. And uh, uh, so for this part, um, so basically we start from just a defined score function for event, and then turn the score function into a probability with a soft max uh, kind of a transform a transformation, which is a kind of a straightforward method. But let's take a further look at the score function of the event because that's the most essential part. Okay, so as I said, for each event, it connects to uh, maybe like 10 different entities, right? So we want to decompose this event into pairwise interactions between uh, two entities. So suppose we have 10 entities, then we need to consider uh, choose two out of 10 like for, uh, 45 pairs of uh, entities. So we hope that they are close to each other, then the score function is going to be higher. So, so in other words, the score function uh, like is a summation, uh, is a weighted summation of the uh, kind of clo closeness score between two entities linked to that event. Okay, but here, uh, how we can evaluate uh, with the two uh, invading vectors to the two uh, uh, entities, 
uh, closed or not. We just use dot product, but we can replace this kind of closeness uh, score function uh, with many other possible formulas, like cosine similarity, for example. But that's just one part. Okay, the second part is that we also need to measure whether this type of interaction is important or not. For example, we can imagine probably the symptom and the like weight, these two types of uh, entities, their interaction is important. But whether uh, the symptom and the admission date, which I have not included in my illustration example, but you can consider that could be a, a kind of uh, attribute that we want to consider. But this interaction probably is not that important because probably are saying that the admission date probably is not that uh, related to uh, the symptom. And uh, uh, of course, you can tell us according to the like uh, your expertise. Uh, knowledge, but for us, we're saying that how about we just uh, let the data tell whether this type of interaction is important or not. So that's why for the score function, it is comprised of two parts. So it's a weighted summation of uh, the pairwise similarity between uh, two entities, and uh, the two components, one component is that we need to measure how similar, how close two entities are, and we also need to put a weight to indicate uh, how important is this type of interaction. Okay, different type of interaction definitely will have different important score. So after we have the score function for the event, uh, with the higher score uh, means that the event is going to appear uh, with a higher probability, right? So then we just turn that uh, score function again using the softmax probability, uh, softmax transformation. So we got the probability. So now, once we have a probability for event, everything uh, becomes simple because the remaining thing we need to do is try to estimate the parameters uh, uh, that can maximize the events that we have observed. Okay, so so again, what are the parameters here? So there are two types of parameters. The first type of parameter is that the embedding for the entities. And another type of a parameter is like the important score for each type of interaction. Okay, so this is a graphical illustration. Probably you can skip this. Um, but anyway, later, once we have the probability for each event, we just try to write down the likely, uh, log likelihood function to observe all these events. And then we can uh, do the learning part. There are some trick here, though. So um, probably I just uh, use one or two sentences to illustrate check to do the learning because in the learning function if we really wanted to compute this softmax function the denominator actually the possible event you can imagine how many possible events are there in, in this event space it's just too many right so it's very inefficient for us to really compute the denominator so that's why we use some other trick Instead of do, really to do that kind of computation, we use a, a kind of standard technology called NCE to uh, make this problem uh, into a, a kind of classification problem. So in this way, we only need to like take care of uh, some non-existing events. So suppose we have observed a patient admission in the first row here, okay, and then we try to generate some artificial admission record. For example, we, we fix all the remaining things, but we, uh, for the weight, this attribute type, we just uh, pick a, a different value, for example, normal or, or light weight, okay? So, and this one, we need to make sure it has not been observed, and it's uh, very likely not observed because uh, the whole thing is like made by us, so it's very unnatural. So by using this positive events and this artificially generated negative events, we can estimate our parameters in a more efficient way. Okay, so uh, for this one, unfortunately, I do not have a real examples uh, in, in like by using this uh, patient admission, uh, this kind of data. But what we have is kind of um, uh, like process, process event data. So it's like uh, 
this is a setting like people try to see whether uh, access to a, a computer is a normal or normal. So it's like um, we know which user using uh, which IP to kind of access which computer, things like that. We want to know whether this sort of login is kind of a normal event. And this is a real data set, um, but it, unfortunately it's not in the uh, healthcare domain. But here the main uh, message I want to deliver in that, if we look at the performance, like how likely we can identify this abnormal events, uh, our method, which is called APE, actually they, they are significantly better than the existing uh, method. So the existing method condition, so it's kind of simple probabilistic method and this uh, compression based method, they're, they're just uh, much, much better, okay. So, and also more importantly, our method is very efficient because we have utilized this trick to make our learning more efficient. So, um, so because the uh, uh, example is kind of uh, in a different domain, so I just want to show some some like interesting case study that probably we, it's easier for us to like understand the meaning of the embedding. So here, so in our this uh, kind of uh, uh, login uh, event example, there is one attribute type ca called hours, so like when you log into a computer. Okay, so these numbers are just the hour, okay, from 0 to 23. So we do not have gave any heuristics like whether um, uh, 1 is closer to 2 or like 23 is closer to 0 because uh, our 0 and our 23, uh, 23, of course, they're close to each other. But we do not get, give any like um, kind of heuristic or pre-knowledge to it. We would just say, okay, they are discrete values and discrete entities and let data to determine whether they are close or not. So here now every number or every hour or discretized hour has been mapped into uh, uh, this kind of 2D space. And if they are close to each other in this 2D space, uh, it simply say that, uh, says, that, uh, says they are close to each other in terms of their invading or low dimensional feature uh, representation. So if we look at this picture, we can say that, okay, it makes so much sense, right? So we just naturally know that, okay, 1 a.m. is closer to uh, 2 a.m. and uh, like uh, 11 p.m. is close to the zero, uh, zero okay, so midnight. So it's just uh, told by the data. And the second thing that we can really know which type of interaction is more important. For example, here uh, I just, uh, uh, show something. So, so, for example, here. Okay, so we can see that uh, if we are using some like application to access the computer, most likely it just can access a certain photo. Okay, if we observe that this kind of application try to access a different or unusual photo, then very likely it's abnormal event. Okay, so. Uh, um, so basically the data can also tell us which type of interaction is more important. Uh, okay, so although I do not have uh, the patient admission uh, example for our method, recently uh, we have a study to uh, see uh, how we can use this microbiome uh, data to predict disease of, uh, of a person. Okay, so we can use a very similar idea of the previous method, APE, to determine whether uh, this person with this uh, kind of microbiome sample uh, is, is healthy or is with some sort of disease. So the first picture is, is that by using our embedding technology, we can actually embed um, those uh, OTUs um, in, in this map. Um, so we can, so the color actually means that uh, in which part we get those OTUs. So for example, uh, the orange one are, are OTUs sampled from oral places. So basically we can say that uh, the OTUs from different uh, part, parts of human body, actually they are more similar to each other. Okay, so this is kind of visualization 
uh, of those invasions. So, so, so basically, do not use the knowledge uh, from which part, which part of human body we have uh, get those samples. But uh, fortunately, if we do the invading, we find that mm, the the OTUs come from the same part of the body. They actually indeed close to each other, which also quite reasonable. The next thing that we try to use uh, those samples uh, to predict whether a person has some sort of disease. We have some preliminary results to predict two types of disease. Of course, the second one cannot be called a disease, but it's obesity prediction. The first one is uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, a kind of uh, a disease that can uh, very difficult to like detect by using the traditional methods. So if we look at the accuracy, actually it's very high, it's around 90%. So basically, essentially, by using our technology, and if we look at those microbiome tests, we can really tell whether you have some sort of disease. So for this one, we're exploring other diseases like cancer and things like that. So we're uh, collaborating with other researchers, try to collect more data and try to have more systematic uh, results in this direction. Okay, so let's come to the second part. Um, so other, yeah, it, like the title is like also identification for anonymized papers, uh, but uh, actually it's in general a, a link prediction problem. Uh, but fortunately, I think this problem is easier to access because it's just like, okay, for a paper, if we hide its authors, can we use the remaining uh, objects linked to this paper to predict its true authors? So it's like, suppose we know the paper is submitted to uh, a venue a certain year with some certain keywords, and we know its references, this kind of very similar to our double uh, uh, double blind review sitting in, in many computer science conferences. So can we predict authors? All right. So in general, we can consider many other applications, for example, drug recommendation, because essentially previously in, in this author identification example, we want to predict whether there's a link between paper and some existing author. And in the drug recommendation setting, we try to predict link between a patient and drug. Okay, so essentially they are very similar. So what are the challenges here? Okay, so again, uh, it's like under this link prediction problem, how we can guide uh, the invading generation under uh, our heterogeneous network. And the second, it's like in this setting, actually, we assume there are some sort of a guidance. For example, we know that for some people, uh, these are their true authors. And in the drug recommendation setting, we know that for some drugs, for some patient drug pairs, this drug really uh, treated well of those patients. We know, do know some labels. But of course, intuitively, those labels are very limited, right? So how we can utilize the more global information that are in the heterogeneous network to to get a uh, better invading. Okay, so for this uh, part, we propose to uh, kind of use uh, the so-called meta path based augmentation to uh, get uh, like global information uh, between entities. So I will give more concrete examples later. So in other words. Uh, in terms of solution, actually, it contains two, two, two components. The first component is that we want to use those labels. For example, the patient and drug, they kind of uh, uh, like work well together, right? So we have those nice labels. We want to use those labels to make sure that uh, the direct connected entities with those labels are kind of close to each other. So we want to see that, we want to force, uh, for example, uh, this patient and drug are close to each other in the invading space if they, there's a kind of labor between them. Okay, in the author identification example, suppose I know that author Ting Chen who is my student, and the keyword heterogeneous net invading, um, uh, write a paper with that keyword, then we want to force Ting Chen heterogeneous network embedding as close uh, as possible to each other, right? 
but definitely it's not enough because how many papers you possibly have written and how many of them are collected in our training example and how possible like uh, for the patient and the drug cases like even more difficult because you definitely cannot ask uh, like the patient to take all the possible tr drug and try to see whether that drug works well for that uh, patient or not, right? Mm, so, in addition to the label or supervised information, we really want to utilize many other information that uh, in network. For example, in author identification example, uh, we want to use other Paths, for example, a keyword link to some papers, the paper cite to other papers, and that paper have a keyword like node representation. Then by following this path, naturally we know that, okay, probably this heterogeneous networking mating should be close to the keyword node re representation. Okay, so this sort of knowledge, this sort of closeness cannot be uh, fully obtain from those labels. So that's why we also need to use the remaining network structure. And in the drug and the patient case, probably we know that uh, this drug connect to some uh, chemical compounds. That a chemical compound somehow, uh, sorry, um, okay, so, let me see, okay. So it says my uh, screen sharing is paused. So I tried to fix the problem. Is everything okay now? Um, we can still see your slides. Can you try um, going forward or backward one to see if we can still see it? Okay. So how about now? No, I'm okay. Let me uh, reshare like we did earlier. Uh, let me see, okay. So how about now? So is everything okay now? Yeah, go forward and backward slides real quick. Okay. Uh, yes, we can see it now, perfect. Okay, great, great. Okay, so like, yeah, so in the drug recommendation case, like sometimes we know that, okay, the two drugs are similar because the two drugs uh, connect to the same chemical compound. And sometimes we know that two patients are similar because they share a similar gene and many other factors, right? So basically our heuristic, so, so the heuristics here are very clear. So basically we want to use both the uh, label information and the uh, non-labeled data which is captured by this network to jointly train the mating for those entities. Okay, so uh, for the technical part, I just want to briefly mention it. So basically, um, uh, still I use example of like uh, author identification uh, for pa uh, papers. So basically for each paper, since they are linked to uh, many other entities and then uh, again we just wanted to represent those entities like keywords, references and venues which are uh, observed previously as some feature vector and then each paper is some sort of average okay some sort of average of all its linked entities okay so once we know the embedding for the paper and we know the embedding of the authors then we can just uh, compute the kind of similarity score between a paper and the author. So naturally, you want to say that the author with the highest similarity score to the paper uh, are likely the authors, the true authors for the paper. But here, when I say, suppose we know those embeddings, actually we do not know. So those are can, kind of parameters that we want to learn. So that that is the actually the first part, how we can force uh, the 
uh, like author and a paper, they are similar in the embedding space by using labels because we can just define the loss function because like for each paper we know that A is a true author and B is not. And definitely we hope that the score function between paper and author is higher than the paper uh, and uh, B. Okay. Um, so, so basically for the first part we define loss function to force the invading of the two uh, related entities that are close to each other. The so next, how we can use the remaining information in the network to do to, to, to further enrich the embedding, try to bring things that are not directly linked in the supervised labors together. Okay, so um, here we propose to uh, use the so-called meta path to augment the network and use that network we can do embedding. So here uh, again, uh, by looking at the um, drug recommendation example, okay. Some meaningful meta paths could be drug connect to chemical compound, chemical compound connect to other drugs. So now we have a meta path between drugs via this drug, chemical compound drug, this meta path, right? Another example is that for patient, we can kind of connect two patients using another meta path like patient, gene, patient. Okay, so of course we can define many other and many. A uh, very complicated meta path to augment this network. So once we have this meta path based uh, uh, like meta path based relation, okay. So then we can use those meta paths to define whether the two entities are close to each other, right? So uh, when I give you an example of uh, connecting drugs by chemical compound or connecting patients by genes, right? So there's just uh, some possible way to define. Uh, the similarity between them because for patient we can also define another meta path saying that patient to symptoms and then to patient. So this meta path is actually saying that we define similarity between patients according to whether they share some similar symptoms. Right. So we can use this kind of meta path and use this um, uh, again the using the embedding to define the probability how likely following this meta path, this patient can uh, can uh, reach that patient. Okay, so we can define probability. And since for for this uh, patient share symptom, this meta path, suppose we have fixed this meta path, we have observed all the possible past instances. So then we can use the probability to again write down a likelihood function. Okay, and then we can estimate the invading uh, by optimize, uh, optimizing this local likelihood function. But here, the problem in that we have many meta paths, right? Patients can go, can reach each other uh, via sharing symptoms, and they can also reach each other by sharing genes. So which meta paths we should trust? Okay, so that's a huge problem, so which I will discuss uh, later. But I suppose we know that which meta paths to include, okay? So then our upper function actually contains two parts. The first part is the uh, kind of uh, supervised task guided loss function. And the second part is that for each important uh, meta path, we're going to define a, a log likelihood function and then by combining the two objectives together, we have our unified object function. Then the remaining part is like we're going to learn the uh, parameters. Here, the parameters adjust the embeddings for each entities. But again, how we can select the meta path? We haven't uh, answered that question yet. So here, we use a very simple approach. So the idea is that initially, every time we just include one single meta path. So for example, uh, the patient uh, like uh, co uh, sharing symptom metapaths or patient co sharing gene metapaths. Every time we just include one of them. And then we combine that metapath based loss function with a supervised based function, and then we learn embedding. And we try to test the embedding on our validation uh, data set to see whether that can give us a good performance for, for example, drug recommendation. Okay. 
So in this case, since we do this one by one, so we can really rank the single metapath according to their performance for this task. And what we do next is that we try to add those uh, metapaths one by one, okay, starting from the best performed metapaths and then add the second performed metapaths until we see that by including an additional metapaths, the performance of, say, drug recommendation will, uh, will be even worse, so we we'll stop, okay. So for experiments, uh, so as I said, unfortunately, it's just the author um, identification example, but I'm, I'm going to show that uh, this is the meta path selection process, okay? So basically, we prepare a lot of possible meta path, and we just rank their performance according to whether they are helpful for us to predict whether the author is a true author for a paper. So here, I just want to show uh, what are the top selected metapaths here. So it turns out that so this the most important metapaths actually is um, the references that you are using. Okay, so if we look at the references of the paper and we know that people have a certain habit to cite their own papers or follow some certain authors, so that they do have this sort of habit. So it actually is the most important one to identify uh, who is the true author of a paper. And the right picture actually showing that we don't need to include many meta, meta path, okay. And actually, if you include additional meta path, the performance is getting worse. It's not getting better because those meta paths now become some sort of irrelevant information to this task. So if you include them into your object function, just uh, uh, getting things even worse, okay. So if we look at the author identification performance, again, it's kind of a significant enhancement to the traditional feature engineering-based methods. The so-called feature engineering that people use heuristic to design which feature is more important and then uh, fit in uh, those uh, like handcrafted features into the uh, well-known models. But uh, by using our uh, embedding method, the performance is just much, much better, okay. Um, so, um, and uh, here I want to mention that our algorithm is very efficient. So in this case, we just uh, perform our task on the rear, like computer science, bibliographic database, this size of data. Of course, it's smaller than uh, PubMed, but still it contains around like 2 million papers and things like that, and 1 million authors. So in this case, for every paper, we want to consider all the one million authors, okay, just because they are all possible candidates to, to write this paper. So, but we can uh, really uh, do it uh, kind of in in very short time. We can really try to go through all those one million authors to determine, okay, who is possibly the true authors for a given uh, paper. Um, so for this one, uh, Actually, we have some preliminary studies on drug recommendation that is very preliminary, I have to say. Um, so this data set we have, uh, uh, is obtained from this MIMIC data, so I think it's provided by MIT. So it's um, ICU uh, uh, patient admission uh, record. And uh, we, we try to say that if we hide some links between patient and drug, whether we can recommend those hide it uh, links in a very high accuracy. So we have some some other byproduct because we can do embedding, right? Because we know that uh, in health setting, actually, it's very difficult to uh, like normalize the description of uh, symptoms. So here we find that by uh, do, using our approach, we can actually somehow find the similar symptoms for a given symptom. So yeah, example like a blurred vision. Okay, we just try to f f identify uh, which symptoms are most similar to this one. So if we check those things like vertigo and diplop here, and actually they're kind of re related to blurred vision. So now somehow uh, it's very helpful because uh, sometimes if we are interested in to connect patients by similar symptoms, but the symptoms are described in different ways. If you just directly use this link information, 
uh, probably cannot really determine uh, the true similarity between two patients. But now we're saying that, okay, don't worry, because even the sim similar symptoms are described in different terminology, but uh, again, the invading uh, of them are close to each other, so all the information actually have already been encoded in the embedding. And then, uh, if we want to see whether two patients are similar to the symptom, all those kind of messages have been already utilized. So we don't need to worry that uh, problem anymore. So the next slide, actually, we try to embed uh, the disease also into like 2D space. So here we just select uh, pneumonia related diseases and uh, uh, by just the first glance of look we, we find that we, we actually can group pneumonia together so which is good sign. Um, so basically that's the applications uh, for, for drug recommendation which, which is very preliminary as I said and uh, we are still working on it. Um, for the summary so basically the main message I want to deliver today is that um, the network invading approach is very effective and very efficient to my networks. Okay, and uh, different types of links they have different importance. Okay, and this is very uh, uh, even more clear if we consider different types of tasks because different types of tasks really uh, require us to select different type of information in the network. Although we're using the same network but we need to select different piece of information and another thing that um, this metapath augmented uh, uh, network is very helpful because metapath naturally can help us to do the sort of feature selection in the network and each metapath actually can uh, can capture uh, different types of similarity between those entities okay so uh, Although today I just mentioned two applications like number detection or drug recommendation, those uh, applications, but many other problems can be really um, formalized into a heterogeneous network and uh, a lot of uh, other applications can be further explored. So, okay, so basically that's uh, my uh, presentation, so I'm not sure uh, we, we still have QA session, but I'm happy to take some questions. Do we have any questions? Uh, sorry, it's uh, it's Pei Pei. I'm I'm muted. <laughs> That's what it's talking. Okay. Uh, you, you, Joe. This is uh, we. It's educational. We learn so much. This is so exciting. Um, we, we really look forward to talking to you more uh, about different elements of it and uh, see if we can start to have uh, a collaborative project uh, moving forward. Uh, yeah, very to. educational. There's so much uh, details. Um, I know many of it I don't have a full comprehension yet, uh, but it I'm very impressed and, and very touched. So I, I can see why uh, Waze always she speaks so highly of you. Um, this this is impressive stuff. And so basically, I really want to show some like real applications in in the biomedical domain, healthcare domain. Um, so I also I try very hard, but fortunately now we are together. So I think it's. Like a really good time to like have a collaboration in these directions. Sure, sure, fantastic. Um, so, are, is Wei online? Wei? Yes, I'm online. Hi. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe we could have uh, more discussions later. Sure, sure. Yeah. I I want to add like next uh, actually next uh, Thursday Friday. Another uh, um, current student of uh, Professor Jia Wei Han, his name is Xiang Ren. Uh, he's uh, our faculty candidate in computer science. He's visiting Thursday, Friday next week. His talk is Thursday known in 4760 in Boulder Hall. I okay. believe he has a schedule 
uh, Friday morning to meet with uh, David and the others. But uh, everybody uh, is welcome to uh, join the uh, the talk on Thursday noon and the Friday morning meeting. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Yijo. Uh, thank you, Wei. Thank you, Wei. So we'll look forward to talk uh, more about this. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And look forward to the uh, future collaborations. Oh, sure, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you again for the presentation and thank you for everyone for attending and we'll see you next week.